Great, so welcome everyone to Gender 101 for Addiction Counselors. So this is the first of a series of webinars that are gonna go throughout the rest of the year that are specifically around LGBTQIA uh, population. And it's kind of a series on different topics um, that you'll see throughout the rest of the year, one a month. Most, or I think all of them actually are on Fridays and it's just one time a month. So be on the lookout for those uh, for the rest of the year and join us for whatever topics are of interest for you. So this course today is going to be a very broad overview of gender in general and how it's evolved over time. So we're going to be talking about a couple of different things related to gender, uh, gender development, some terminology and vocabulary that's around these days and kind of how the definition of gender has shifted. Uh, and what gender looks like today that's maybe different than what it has in the past. So let's get started. So first I wanna talk about in general how gender has been defined. So in the past, there's been basically a binary gender definition in the United States and in kind of Western culture in general for the most part. So what I mean by binary is is that there are two options, male or female, and that those are the, uh, the two general categories that have historically been there for what a person is gender-wise. So basically in, in the past, what has happened is uh, a child is born in the hospital and the doctor, whoever's delivering the baby says, it's a girl, it's a boy, uh, and that is their gender going forward and typically how a person is raised has a lot to do with their gender you know that girls do certain things boys do certain things um, and those are kind of some messages that are given to kids as they grow and depending you know there's a lot of factors involved there but uh, that's kind of a general historical look at how we've defined gender and that has been slowly but surely evolving particularly in the past decade so let's take a look at what, how things have evolved. So first of all, um, there's been some identification of different components of gender. So you see in the red circle in the middle that gender is kind of an umbrella term. And then you see these little yellow dots all around. So the three main components of gender are biology, your biological characteristics, your identity, how you identify your gender, and then expression, how you express your gender. But what is separate is sexual orientation. So sexual orientation really isn't a part of uh, how somebody identifies their gender. Sexual orientation is about attraction, who they're attracted to, uh, what kind of people they want to be in intimate relationships with, uh, things like that. So we're not going to talk much about sexual orientation today, other than kind of di to differentiate it from gender. So we're going to focus on these other three components, biology, identity, and expression. So let's look at biology first. So taking a look at biology has to do with anatomy, chromosomes, and hormones. So you'll see the blue bubble on the left and the and the pink bubble on the right. So basically that's our traditional binary concepts of gender, male and female. So in the blue bubble is male, typically have XY chromosomes, heavy testosterone, um, and traditionally male genitalia. And then on the pink, on the other side, we have our traditional female, which could be XX or XY chromosomes, tend to be heavy estrogen in terms of hormones, and genitalia that's traditionally female. And then in the middle, we have the green bubbles. And the green bubbles kind of exemplify other options um, within the gender role that are sometimes in the middle between male and female. So at the top, we have intersex, which previously was called hermaphrodite. So you may have heard that term in the past. That's not really a PC term anymore. Um, typically it's called intersex where there's a combination of genitalia or gonads, 
chromosomes and hormones that could be more traditionally male, could be more traditionally female, but there's kind of a, someone has a mix of the two, biologically speaking. Then in the middle is someone uh, who's transitioning or in the process of transitioning. So someone who maybe um, had, you know, traditionally was, had genitalia that was male and they're transitioning to female. So they may be somewhere in the process of that transition. They may be taking hormones to help them transition uh, one direction or the other. Um, they may be getting surgeries, top surgery or bottom surgery to adjust their genitalia to fit the uh, where they're transitioning to. So they can kind of be in any place along that continuum and that transition. And then the bottom bubble is, is another kind of version of intersex with the biological sex assigned during infancy was achieved through medical procedures. So what that means is basically that when a child was born with a mix of male and or traditionally male and traditionally female genitalia that there was some medical procedures performed in order to either usually to remove some genitalia that may be extra or uh, maybe they have more male genitalia than they do female genitalia and so they the doctors do some medical procedures at birth or shortly thereafter um, in the early childhood years to to kind of either remove certain certain genitalia components or to um, to make someone fit better into one particular category of either male or female. So that that part involves some decisions that were made either by caregivers or doctors on behalf of the child in order to determine and align genitalia with the gender identified at birth. So there's a, this is specifically about biology. So this is really focused on what is going on in the body. And if, and most of the time it's related to hormones and components of genitalia. So that's only one piece. So like I said, when I started talking about the binary components or um, kind of those categories of male and female that we've traditionally had, the goal historically for kind of physicians and caregivers has been to kind of have a child fit into one of those categories. So if they have kind of a component of both genitalia or, um, you know, too much estrogen, too much testosterone, things like that, that there, there would be potentially treatments or medical procedures done to help them fit better into one of those categories. And so now we're seeing that change, that the biology is not as important um, a determining factor of gender. So we'll see that as we go forward. And it's, so biology is one component. And we can see kind of through, you know, the history of what's publicized in media, uh, we have Marilyn Monroe in the middle, which is like a quintessential feminine um, woman depicted. And then we have the traditional male to your right. And then to your left, the Time Magazine cover has someone that's more kind of androgynous in nature or kind of could fit into either male or female or somewhere in the middle. And so that's what we're getting to is that gender is really evolving to more of a continuum or something kind of in the middle of male or female, that there are other options besides just male and female. So let's look at identity. So gender identity was the second component. So this is someone's psychological sense of self. So how do they identify internally? Um, so you might see all these kinds of term, these different terms. Um, we see the binary options of male and female. We also see um, someone who might be queer, which may not identify in a particular binary gender. So they may not identify as male or female, uh, but some combination or some a third gender. Um, 
we see the term gender fluid, which kind of alludes to the idea that gender might be more of a continuum, that people may not be completely male or completely female. Uh, they may have some combination of both or kind of uh, move in between those two traditional experiences of gender. But it's really about how the person themselves individually, how they identify um, on the inside. So do I identify as male? Do I identify as female? Do I identify as something different, um, something in the middle? Or maybe I don't identify as having a gender at all. And that, that term agender uh, might speak to that. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about these, these terms as we move forward let's look at some visual representations. So you might see, uh, again, this is internal in terms of how somebody identifies internally. So uh, we don't necessarily know how all of these different people in these pictures identify internally, but they're more pushing those boundaries of what we've traditional, tr traditionally seen as the male and female binary. So they may look a little bit more um, kind of in the middle where they don't seem to identify in one of the binary genders, but maybe they're somewhere in the middle or a little fluid and can kind of move between. Um, we might see, um, you know, pushing the boundaries of fashion, like traditionally women wearing dresses, whereas we might see now in fashion, men wearing dresses or skirts, um, things like that, where these these traditionally held ideas of what is a female and what is a male are being uh, changed and challenged. Okay, so let's move on to expression. So expression is how someone communicates their gender to the world. So it's different than identity in terms of, this is how I'm comfortable sharing my gender with those around me. So it's more about the presentation, how I carry myself, the type of clothing I wear, thing, you know, if I wear makeup or no makeup, um, things like that. This is how I express my gender. So probably one of the most uh, notable or the, the most um, kind of what's been out there in the media quite a bit, historically speaking, is drag or cross-dressing, where in drag, um, someone dresses in the opposite gender and it's a very exaggerated representation. So uh, typically you might see a man dressing as a woman uh, where they have kind of more pronounced curves and big hair and lots of makeup and it's sort of an exaggeration and usually in a performance space. So they might be doing, uh, you know, lip syncing to a song or singing a song or they may be doing some kind of performance art in drag. So that's, that's an expression of gender. However, somebody who dresses in drag, it does not mean that they identify as a female, you know, so they may have, they may identify as a male and dress in drag to do performance art, um, you know, on the evenings or weekends or things like that. So they don't necessarily identify as the, uh, as the expression that they're putting out there to the world. So that's kind of a nice representation of how somebody can identify differently than what they are expressing to the world. Um, there's people that like, there's some terminology on here like masculine presenting. So somebody might present in a more masculine way. Maybe they wear a suit, um, maybe they um, have a short haircut that looks more traditionally kind of male in nature. Same thing on the other side, feminine presenting, um, maybe someone wearing um, more traditionally feminine clothing, skirts, uh, lacy tops. They may have longer hair. They may paint their nails, wear makeup, things like that. So it's kind of pushing these boundaries of what traditionally has been seen as exclusively male or exclusively female. But the expression is just what I'm presenting to the world about gender it may not be the same as my biology or my how I identify myself. So these are all kind of separate components of gender, 
and they don't necessarily all, um, they aren't all the same. So someone might have biologically have male genitalia. They may identify as gender fluid, like where they don't necessarily identify in one particular gender, but kind of move in between. And then in terms of expression, they may express more of a, um, you know, they may dress very feminine sometimes, very masculine sometimes, and kind of play with fashion and play with their, uh, the way that they present themselves to kind of be a little bit more fluid, even though they have that male genitalia and identify as gender fluid, they may sometimes dress uh, very masculine presenting and sometimes dress very feminine presenting, like maybe they wear a dress or something like that. So those three things, um, biology, identity and expression all kind of work together in some ways, but it's not always, we can't always see it just looking at somebody. What we see when we look at somebody is generally their expression. So we see how they present themselves, what kind of clothes they wear, um, you know, kind of how they carry themselves, things like that. And kind of what shifted in the world these days is that we can't assume that what we see is how somebody identifies or what their biology might be. And what's been coming out in the media more and more um, lately is about people's self-identity of how they identify their own um, gender, which may not be how they express it or what they show to the world. So those are two different things, but they're interrelated. Uh, and it's important to understand that these are three different components of gender. Um, but also when we look at somebody, we're just seeing most of the time the expression. And so we can't kind of make, we need to be careful about making assumptions related to what we're seeing and how they identify. Because we can kind of easily be offensive to somebody if we're assuming because they're dressed more feminine that they identify as a female, that may not be the case. So it's important um, when we're working with clients that we avoid those assumptions and have a conversation. So on intake documents, and when we're first starting to see a client, we might ask about how do you identify gender wise? And so we know they're telling us how they identify. So that's an important thing uh, when working with clients, particularly um, clients that are of a younger generation. This is much more commonplace for younger generations these days. Um, so they're much more comfortable talking about these different gender components and that expression is different than identity. So, uh, so it's important to make that a part of your intake process and that you're not assuming uh, what somebody's gender is and how they identify. Okay, so here's some pictures just of different expressions. Um, on the left, you see a dress, platform shoes that is a way of expressing. You see a drag queen at the bottom corner, um, the exaggerated kind of hair, big hair, makeup, um, kind of performer-like look. And then at the top, you see more gender neutral clothing that just by seeing someone in that clothing, you may not know, you wouldn't necessarily know how they identify. It's more gender neutral, it could kind of go um, any direction. Okay, so now that we've got the foundation of the components of gender, biology, identity, and expression, now let's move on to some terminology, which you kind of saw some of these, but we'll talk through more of them. So this is kind of what we see in the, the LGBTQIA, all, what all of those letters stand for. Some of them are gender related, some of them are sexual orientation related. So we're gonna make that distinction. So lesbian, let's start there. Lesbian um, traditionally refers to a woman being sexually attracted to another woman. So that's about sexual orientation. Uh, gay is more of an umbrella term, um, can apply to lesbians, can be under the gay umbrella, but also gay could mean 
um, someone who is attracted to the same gender. So that's again, more about sexual orientation, who they're attracted to. So it could be a man attracted to a man, a woman attracted to a woman, um, things like that. Bisexual again is about sexual orientation that they are sexually attracted to more than one gender. So not just attracted to women, but also attracted to men um, or other genders as well. Then um, the T is transgender. So we mentioned this one earlier that someone might be in the process of transitioning or they may have made a transition from one gender to another, which can mean that they've made a physical transformation where they may have gotten surgeries or taken hormones to make a transition from one gender to another, but also could mean that they identify as a uh, a different gender from the one that they were assigned at birth. So they may have some genitalia that's male in nature, and they may be living as a female, for example. So they would be transgender. They may or may not have taken hormones, may or may not have had any kind of surgeries or medical procedures. So that's kind of an umbrella term as well, but it is related to gender. Um, queer is also a term that is related to gender. Sometimes it's also uh, queer and questioning, which there may be two cues. So queer tends to relate to somebody that gender wise, um, they may not identify in a particular gender. They may be just queer. Um, and so they don't necessarily identify in the binary structure of gender. So they don't necessarily identify as male, don't necessarily identify as female, but kind of somewhere, some mixture of both or somewhere in the middle or a, just a third gender. So we just have this kind of umbrella term of queer. And then the other cue of questioning, which is not on the slide, um, but questioning tends to relate to people that are um, kind of unsure about maybe their sexuality or their gender. And so they're questioning. They're not sure that they fall into any particular category or any particular label, but they, they're questioning. They're just kind of exploring that, um, that piece. Intersex is typically the I in um, intersex we already talked about where somebody is some, somewhere in between sexes. So they could be, they could have some biological com components of male and female genitalia or um, hormones, chromosomes. And also they could have had, um, or they, that could also include the lack of. So some people might be born with uh, missing components of genitalia or hormones. And so again, they're somewhere in between um, or intersex. And then an ally is the last uh, letter there. An ally is somebody that is a supporter they don't necessarily identify with any of these other terms, but they are a supporter of the LGBTQI plus um, population. And so I might consider myself an ally because I'm a supporter of people and this population in particular um, and do my best to help and, and advocate and support this community of people. So that would be seen as an ally. So I don't necessarily identify in this community, but you know, am a supporter. So that would that person would be called an ally. Okay, here's again not an exhaustive list, but some of the the kind of main terms that I see out there that I think it's important to be familiar with. And these may be terms that your clients use. So we've already talked about the first one, but gender assigned at birth. This is the assumption that someone's genitals match their gender. So for example, if someone is born with a penis that they would identify as male. If someone's born with a vagina, they identify as female. So that's an assumption um, that their gender is matching with whatever genitalia they have. And typically, kind of going back to that example I said at the beginning of when a child is born, the doctor says it's a boy, it's a girl, it's based on external genitalia that can be seen. 
Um, so someone may be kind of assigned a particular gender at birth based on that, but that's not necessarily how they identify later on. The next term here is gender binary, which we've talked about already as well. That's the traditional idea that gender is binary, that there's only two options, male or female. Then we've also just talked about transgender, um, but basically that their gender identity is different from the one that they were assigned at birth. So for example, if somebody was assigned uh, male at birth, that, um, that at some point recognized their identity was actually female or another gender. And so they would be transgender. Uh, the next one is two spirit, which is a more indigenous term. Uh, Native American tribes in particular, some, not all, um, have had this idea that there's a person that can walk between genders. So they're not necessarily in one category of male or female, but that they can kind of go between genders. And so they, uh, they kind of may identify as two spirit or having a little bit of both genders within them. Cisgender is the idea that gender matches what they were assigned at birth. So if I was assigned female at birth, that I also identify as being female. So remember, gender at birth is usually based on the external genitalia that can be seen, but then identity is an internal um, idea of what your gender is. So cisgender just means that those two things match. So I was identified as being a female at birth, but I also self-identify as being female. So that's cisgender. Gender queer is neither male or female, is between or beyond gender or some combination of genders. So this is a little bit more of an umbrella term um, because it's not, doesn't fit into a category of male or female, but is kind of something else or some combination of genders that's gender queer. Non-binary is also an umbrella term, which just simply means that someone doesn't identify as either a man or a woman. They can, again, be kind of somewhere, some mix, somewhere in between, um, or kind of an entirely different gender. But basically, the, that someone doesn't fit into the traditional notion of binary genders of male or female. Gender fluid um, is, that we've talked about earlier also, but is someone that will fluctuate between genders or can express multiple genders at the same time. So there's more of a fluidity or a movement between genders. Um, and again, this idea that, that gender is not just male or female. And then the last one here is gender neutral, which again is kind of an umbrella term as well, neither male nor female. Um, so doesn't, a person doesn't identify as being in either of those categories, but maybe as a neutral uh, third gender or, uh, or just not simply not fitting into those traditional binary categories of male or female. So you can see a lot of these terms overlap and they're not necessarily, um, they don't necessarily mean completely different things and you might hear them used interchangeably. Uh, like I tend to hear gender neutral with non-binary or gender queer. Uh, those terms kind of I've seen used very interchangeably. Um, there's minor kind of differences, but what's important about these terms is that your clients might use these terms and it's important for you to have you know, through obviously coming to this training and others, kind of an idea of what that means. But it's even more important to ask your client what that means to them. Because they may use a term of gender neutral instead of gender queer for some reason. You know, so, and there's an important distinction for them that's important for me to understand as a clinician working with them. So even though somebody uses a particular term, I still make it a point to ask them even if I know the definition, 
what does it mean to you to be genderqueer? What does it mean to you to be two spirit or whatever term they're using so that I make sure that I'm really understanding what they mean. And again, not making an assumption about their gender and what, how they identify their gender as. And I found that most people are really open to having this conversation and are, and are particularly welcoming of having this conversation uh, because historically we haven't asked. We've just assumed that somebody who looks like a male in their expression when they walk through my door, uh, that that must be a male instead of making it a point to ask that question of how do you identify? So expression wise, you may see uh, someone that expresses themselves in a masculine way, but that may not be how they identify. So it's important to ask those questions. Okay, so let's take a look kind of at gender development through the lifespan. And I think this is also evolving and there's our kind of historical gender development models of you know, different stages and phases is not necessarily the way it happens anymore. And I think we're gonna see going forward some different gender development models that, uh, that will either be tweaks of previous models or um, kind of an evolution of a model. So we'll go through some components of gender development, basically. I don't have a formal model for you, but just uh, components. So thinking about childhood, and the gender messaging that, that kids receive and how that relates to their development. So thinking about labels from adults. So the doctor in the delivery room saying, it's a girl, it's a boy. Um, caregivers, parents, guardians, family members that may say things like, oh, girls don't do that, or boys do this. Uh, Sit like a lady, cross your legs, for example. Um, you know, boys don't cry, um, those kinds of messaging that kids internalize and understand something about their gender as a result. Um, also just looking at even ID cards, you know, we all have a driver's license or some kind of an ID card and it lists a gender on it. Historically speaking, it's only been a male or female option. So it is a label that is put on us from birth and kind of follows us throughout. So, you know, families may raise little boys and little girls differently based on their gender. Uh, and historically speaking, that's been true. So just thinking about all that, that messaging and labeling that kids hear in their environment as they grow. Thinking about a child's personality development, you know, as they start in their toddler years, when they're starting to assert themselves, maybe you're a little sassy, uh, maybe throw fits. It's their, their version of expressing their own desires and opinions. So you may hear, you know, a kid say, I don't want to be a girl. I don't want to be a boy. Um, I don't like this, I don't like that, you know, I want this, I want that. They're starting to express their own desires and opinions and how that's received in the environment that they're growing up in may have something to say and how their gender develops as well. Um, particularly like if a little boy is throwing a temper tantrum, the example of boys don't cry, that might be a, um, something that is said to the child like oh boys don't cry come on get up let's act like a man things like that um so even that just those little offhanded comments kids kind of soak up and internalize and that helps them understand components of gender social awareness kids as they grow are also aware of what's going on around them so at school, in their daycares, with other family and friends, you know, their neighborhood that they, they grew up in, how do they fit in with their peers? Um, are they different? Kids start to gain an awareness of their similarities and differences between their peers. And what is that, how does that influence gender? Same thing with media influence. What kind of TV shows are they watching? Um, what kind of movies and things are they exposed to? 
um, even things like Disney, you know, a lot of kids grew up watching Disney movies and there's princesses and there's knights and there's, um, you know, kind of traditional binary concepts of gender. So, you know, what is, how does a kid internalize that information and that messaging? And then environment and culture play a factor. What's socially and societally acceptable uh, where a kid grows up? Is there, are there religious values that are important? And what is that, how does that contribute to their understanding of gender? So just thinking about as a child, all these different components of the messaging that child's, that children receive and how that helps them grow and understand gender. So there's not anything that's particularly good or bad. It's just understanding um, that kids from a very early age are getting messages about their gender and that has an impact on how they develop. So let's look at adolescence, which is kind of the, the time of exploration and trying to uh, be autonomous and be an adult. So social awareness is exponentially increased as an adolescent. They're less, we all know that they're less um, interested in what their parents or caregivers and family are doing, but they're much more interested in what's going on with their peer groups and social media is a much bigger influence than it ever has been. So what are they, what's the exposure there socially and how is, how is that shaping their view of gender and how they see themselves uh, and their gender? The, this kind of push and pull between autonomy as a teenager, learning and growing and becoming an adult and being autonomous from your parents and caregivers but also still being susceptible to the beliefs of the caregivers still living with caregivers. Um, so kind of that push and pull of being your own person, but then also um, still being influenced and susceptible to the beliefs of, of whoever you're living with and whoever you're around family wise. That developing their own sense of self. So an adolescent is that's kind of the goal of adolescence overall is to develop their own sense of self and move into autonomy where they can separate formally from their family and kind of go out and be sent out to the world and and be hopefully a functional adult um, and be a contributing member of society so that development of self uh, also includes gender um, and kind of their whole belief system around gender, sexuality. Um, there may be a lot of experimentation going on with those concepts. You know, um, they may be exploring kind of sexual encounters, their own sexuality, but then also they may be exploring their gender and be trying out like uh, dressing in a different way or trying out wearing makeup, not wearing makeup, things like that. They're also going through biological and hormonal changes through just the puberty process. So what is that, um, how is that process kind of that's, that's very biological in nature and their body is just naturally going through, how is that impacting their understanding of their own gender and uh, what's going on around them and what's socially acceptable too? And that last bullet point of societal values versus their own values and their peer group values. So uh, there may be some rebellion going on around, around uh, rebelling against society in some way or against parents or caregivers. And kind of, you know, adolescents are also finding their own kind of place, their own uh, group of friends, people that they feel like they fit in with. So it's important that those influences of the peer group become much more, uh, much stronger than even the family in a lot of ways. So what is that kind of messaging um, to the child? How are they experiencing those messages and how is that shaping the way they view their own gender and those around them? So now we're into adulthood. Um, and this is a time, you know, through the rest of your life, kind of in this process of reconciliation of our childhood family of origin with our own sense of self. Who do we want to be? Um, what do we want to express to the world? How do we want to identify? In lots of different ways, gender is just one of them. 
but this reconciliation, hopefully reconciliation, not always, um, but of how you grew up with kind of how you want to be as an adult and how you want to live your life. Gender is a component of that. Your autonomy as an individual human being versus the societal expectations. And depending on where you live in the world, those may vary greatly in terms of what's socially acceptable or society accepts. Um, and so balancing kind of who you are, who you want to be with, uh, with societal expectations. Um, finding a tribe, again, this idea of finding who you fit in with and who are going to be your close uh, friends versus people that may be bad influences or people that are toxic to you. Increased self-awareness throughout the lifespan, really, you know, we kind of gain sort of peeling away an onion um, in terms of becoming more and more self-aware around, again, who we want to be, what's, you know, what kind of scars do we have from just life experiences and how we want to move through those and hopefully move forward in a more healthy way. Um, but again, all of those life experiences could help shape our idea of our own gender and others. And then there's always just the catch-all of environmental and cultural influences, where you live, um, maybe religious influences, specific cultural influences that, um, that may be a part of how, how you view gender as well. Okay, so what the other piece that's important about understanding gender is also asking your clients about the pronouns that they, they want you to use when addressing them. So you may have seen, and this is becoming more and more common, on Zoom meetings or other video conferencing meetings or at, at the signature line of emails, a lot of people have started putting their pronouns in parentheses. So it's clear that they're communicating to others what pronouns they would like other people to use when referring to them. So this is an important thing uh, because again, we often assume that if somebody identifies as male, that they would use the program, pronouns of he or him. Uh, but again, that's an assumption. And so this is also important, an important question to ask your clients when you first start seeing them is how do you identify gender wise and then what pronouns would you like used? So he, him is one we all know, she, her, one we all know. So again, that's male, female. Some newer ones is they, them, um, which is a plural form um, historically speaking, referring to multiple people, but because gender has this more fluid concept now that there's more of a continuum that somebody doesn't necessarily fit into the binary he, him, or she, her, that using they, them for a singular person um, is also appropriate. Or Z, I've seen um, frequently, which can be spelled either Z-E or Z-I-E, but it sounds like the letter Z, like C, Z, um, it also can be spelled as X-E. So it's important, uh, and that's just kind of a, again, a concept out of gender fluidity that there's, there's not just these binaries, but there's uh, a variety potentially of genders that are out there. And so Z is kind of identifying that somebody doesn't fall into any one particular category or uh, specific gender category, but it may be more, more fluid. So that's become more and more common that I've seen people uh, want to be called Z. Also, some people don't really feel like any of these pronouns are appropriate for them. And so they want you to call their name, call, call them their name. So even if you might use a pronoun in a sentence like, oh, she went down the street, instead you would say Sally went down the street or Bob went down the street. And you would just replace any pronoun with the person's name. And again, that's the idea that there's not just one category, um, but that I'm a unique individual and my identity gender-wise um, 
may be one thing, but also just going by my name is appropriate as well. So these, this is a great question to ask on your intake or assessment forms is what are your pronouns and what is your gender identity? So you're not making those assumptions and inadvertently offending somebody and then and thereby shutting them down. So it's kind of like you don't want to shut somebody down the right at the beginning and being sensitive to these kind of our world is changing when it comes to gender and the definition of gender is significantly expanding uh, and it's still expanding like this isn't we haven't arrived yet I don't think so we'll continue to see a terminology change pronouns change so that's why I think it's really important to ask the clients what they want to be called so that um, and to then ask kind of what that means to them so if somebody identifies as gender neutral you know, I often will will to ask that follow up of what does gender neutral mean to you, and then using the the appropriate pronoun that they want to be called is really important throughout the therapeutic process in working with somebody. Okay, so how does this kind of translate not just into the assessment process, but also into uh, into treatment into the treatment world? So it's interesting um, when we think about gender and how pervasive it is in our language, it's important to, um, when we're working with clients that may, that don't fit into that gender binary of male and female, that we're paying attention to the terminology that we use and the, the messaging about gender that we might use. So first and foremost, we all, you know, I think I might be beating a dead horse here. I'm not sure, but uh, Trauma-informed care is hugely important. So we have in addiction treatment, um, I would say most of our clients have some trauma history. So it doesn't really matter how they identify gender-wise, but having trauma-informed care can be really important for all genders. And integrating trauma treatment into addiction treatment is really important because um, that can also be a component of what's going on with our clients and if they're having any kind of kind of gender identity questioning or um, or you know even sexuality kind of concerns and questioning, they there might be an element of trauma in there that needs to be explored and treated as well to help them um, kind of move forward in that process. So integrating trauma and addiction treatment is important teaching clients mindfulness and grounding, which is a component of a lot of addiction treatment these days, um, partly because of, you know, addiction being uh, impulsive and impul there's an impulsivity component to addiction. And so teaching people mindfulness and grounding can help them manage the impulsivity of addiction, but also can help somebody slow down and just uh, gain more self-awareness around what might be going on with them. And if there is any kind of question or they're struggling uh, with their gender identity in any way, then this can help them process through that in a little bit different way that's non-judgmental non and safe for them um, and helps them kind of center themselves and be more comfortable with themselves. And the third bullet point is just creating a safe place and avoiding sh avoid shaming. Um, I think we all would say that we, we don't shame people and I don't think we try to, but also we could inadvertently kind of be contributing to someone's shame by, um, by not being kind of open and, and welcoming around the way that they might identify gender wise. So gender affirming care uses the appropriate pronouns and terminology. So again, everything we've just talked about in terms of what pronouns does somebody want to be called, um, making sure we're understanding the terminology when they use a, a particular term around gender, asking them, what does that mean to them? And that we have some basic understanding of the terminology that's out there, which is also going to be geographically different, perhaps. So if you live in one part of the country or the state, um, there may be different terms used than in other parts. 
So it's important to have a basic understanding, but then to do that extra step of asking somebody uh, what that word means for them. And avoiding assumptions or language that uh, speaks to gender. So that men do this, women do this, or, um, you know, which is that inadvertent shaming that we're maybe not intentionally trying to shame somebody, but accidentally do it um, by making a um, gender statement. Uh, using inclusive language, avoiding jargon, stereotypes, um, being culturally sensitive to what might be going on with a particular person and managing, I will throw in managing our own biases there too. Um, we all have biases. So it's not a question of if we have biases, it's about, it's a question of what are they and how do they come through in the treatment that we provide? And is it um, kind of negatively impacting treatment? And a lot of people have uh, biases around gender, you know, have specific ideas of what gender is, what the definition should be. Um, there's oftentimes very strong opinions about gender that people have. And how is that coming through in, in the work that you're doing clinically? Um, so there may be some facial expressions that you make that communicates a mes message to clients or body language showing discomfort when a client's talking about a gender issue, if you're not comfortable talking about uh, gender, then, then again, that's something to, to kind of explore and perhaps get some consultation or supervision around to make sure that you, you're not inadvertently um, contributing to kind of stereotypes that might be out there or, you know, accidentally offending a client um, or a client just shutting down and not wanting to kind of engage with you anymore. Um, also, if you work with the LGBTQIA plus uh, populations, then I would always encourage to get more and more training. There's new trainings coming out, oh, you know, frequently about this population or elements of working with this population. And particular, particularly in the addiction space, um, there's a significant amount of trauma that, that people that are identified being a part of this LGBTQ plus community uh, often experience. So um, we want to make sure we're not contributing or adding to that negativity and creating a nice safe space for them to explore whatever's gone on in their life, which also could include um, elements of gender. In terms of our treatment groups and our programs, a lot of treatment programs have a group therapy component um, or a psychoeducational component. And so incorporating um, concepts of gender in, in those groups, managing bullying, um, and perhaps considering gender non-binary treatment groups. So having, if you have gender related groups, so if you have a women's group or a men's group, then you might also have a non-binary group where people who don't necessarily fit into those categories could go to, um, to a group where they feel like maybe they fit in a little bit better. And then integrating gender affirming medical care. Um, if you're gonna work, if you work with uh, particularly the transgender population, then uh, there's often hormones or medical procedures or or uh, surgeries, things like that, that people might be interested in getting. And that's gonna be a component of their care. Um, it's gonna impact them hormonally, which can also impact their ability to manage emotions, uh, impulsivity, things like that. Um, and if they also have an addiction issue, then integrating all of that into care, working with uh, their medical team, if they're the physicians or surgeons that are working with them, as well as the addiction treatment components and any mental health or other um, healthcare providers that might be involved, that we're including all of those components and working together to help somebody. Okay, and that's the end. So I just have a couple of minutes. I don't see any 
uh, questions in the chat, but I'll kind of go through my reminders uh, that I went through at the beginning. Um, and if anybody puts any questions in there, I'll address those as well. But just as a reminder, you will get an email um, shortly after this, this webinar ends and you will be able to take a little quiz. So hopefully you're paying attention and remember things, uh, but I think it'll be fine. Take a little quiz, a little satisfaction survey, and then you will get your certificate right away. So um, let us know if, if you have any technology glitches with that. But otherwise, I don't see any new questions in the chat. So this recording will be available um, on the school's website. So the CADA SABH school's website, once we get it up there and you can watch it later and get continuing education credits or refer your colleagues that weren't able to get here today to that as well. So thank you so much for being here and have a wonderful week, uh, month, I will see you next month if you join us and stay safe and dry. Bye-bye.